We hear the word love all the time. We hear it in the music that we listen to, and the shows that we watch on TV, the books we read, the movies we see. You'd think we really abide in love in the way this word infuses our culture. We say, I love God, I love my spouse, I love my family, and that's love. We say, I love my job, again, love. We may say we love music, sports, reading, taking naps. Father Bill says, I love my cat, and that's love. I say, I love Santini's pizza, and that's love too. But those are all different kinds of love. We use the same word, but we mean very different things. Now Jesus tells his disciple at the Last Supper, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. What kind of love is that? It's the perfect love of God who is love. It is his offering of himself, an eternal creating, giving, redeeming, forgiving love. Christ's love aims for the greatest good, communion with him in this life and in heaven forever. That's nothing like the way we love our job or our pets or our favorite food. It's not just a difference in the degree of love, but in the kind of love, because that love is God's love. It's the love that caused Jesus to become one of us and carry the cross for us, that love that compelled him to give his earthly life up so that we can know his love, true love, and abide in that true love. Our language is imprecise, and so sometimes the real meaning of words are lost on us. We use the word love quite often, but we have to be mindful of the way that we use it. We may say, as I do, I love pizza, but we don't mean it in such a way that we would say, I love you, pizza. That's not the way that we use that word. Not even I would do that. I don't usually talk to my food. I just enjoy it. Jesus says, no one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And in this way, he prepares his disciples to see his passion and death for what it is. He lays down his life for his friends. He makes an offering of himself from the cross for our greatest good, reconciliation and union with God. Whatever other good things there are in this world, that union with God made possible by Christ's sacrifice is the greatest good. It is Christ's sacrifice and in his sacrifice that we see not only what love is and what love does, but who love is. The Apostle John tells us God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. Of all the loves that I described and all of the loves that we speak about day in and day out, there is only one love worth living for, one love worth dying for. We live the love of God so that we can live for our spouse and our family. Me, for my spouse, the bride of Christ, and God's family here in the church, you for your spouse and your family. A job is not worth living for, not in the same way we live for our spouse and our family. And certainly our love for other good things of the world can only serve that perfect love. They cannot rise above it. None of them are an end in themselves. Living your job, living for money, living uh, for other good things of the world, living for pizza, it is not going to get anyone to heaven. Only living Christ will get us to heaven and living his love. Last week, I spoke about Dolores Hart, the movie star from the 50s and 60s who became a nun and is now the mother superior of a Benedictine abbey in Bethlehem, Connecticut. She was engaged to be married before she answered the call of Christ's love uh, to religious life. She was deeply in love with her fiancé, an architect named Don Robinson. And when she broke off the engagement, something that was very difficult for the both of them, she told him, Every love doesn't have to wind up at the altar. And that's true. But every love begins at the altar. Because every true love is rooted in Christ in the Eucharist. Christ gives us the gift of his love so that we can love as he loves. St. John says, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son for us. 
Now that is true self-sacrificing love, the love that we're all called to live and abide in, especially in our marriage and our families. Today's Mother's Day, and as far as we're concerned, besides it uh, being a Sunday, uh, Mother's Day is a sacred day for us. One of our parishioners told me when they were growing up, every Mother's Day from the rising of the sun to its setting, mom didn't have to do anything. Dad and the kids took care of everything for her as a sign of thanks for all she did for them. And this is one of the reasons why our high school youth group doesn't meet on Mother's Day. We all belong with our family today, showing that gratitude and love to our mother who gave us life and did all those things that help us on our way to becoming who God made us to be. And I think all moms here would agree with me. One day is not enough to show that gratitude. As I've gotten older, that has become more and more clear to me. When we have an expression in our imprecise language for the thanks that we should have for our mothers, it is undying gratitude. Undying gratitude. We know that the word Eucharist comes from the Greek word that means thanksgiving. So living the Eucharist is undying gratitude. It is living the love of Christ, that love that makes it possible for us to live the greatest good for our families, and living that love day by day is living that gratitude for our mothers. Young people, you know who you are out there. I know by the time you get to high school, you think to yourself, I can't wait to get to college. I can't wait to be off on my own, to be free, finally. But you're living the years now that will probably be the most years of your life that your whole family is together under one roof. It's a shame to be longing for the time when you can jump out of the nest and fly, when you should be cherishing this time that you have, this time that you have together. Like today is sacred. That life, that family life is sacred. It is a gift, a gift that you should all be grateful for, grateful in such a way that you live that love and live that gratitude. If you truly know what love is and who true love is, You will see that love reflected in your parents, that love flowing from God to your parents and to you. And that's how that you can live that undying gratitude, by returning it to God and returning it to your parents. And husbands, you know the kind of love that you're called to. It is the love of Christ himself. St. Paul says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loves his bride, the church, and gave himself up for her to sanctify her. That is true love, self-sacrificing love. Love that always wishes for the greatest good without counting the cost. That is the noble calling of every husband and father, to love with the mind and the heart of Christ. And that is the love that is possible for all of us husbands and fathers to abide in. I am, like you, a husband and a father, husband to the bride of Christ, a father to his family. And we can live that love because of the grace of Christ, We can live that grace when our hearts are open to Christ in the Eucharist and to him in daily prayer. And that is the true love we, each of us, husbands and fathers, owe our bride. That is a love that is owed to them. Today when we tell our mothers and the mother of our children that we love them, we know what kind of love that is. It is the love of the heart of Christ, the love of God who is love, the love that we can live because God has loved us first, because Jesus has offered himself for us and given himself to us. With our hearts open to him in the Eucharist, we can live as he calls us to live. We can live that perfect love every day, 